the companies that I see using microbiome testing with all respect, the advice that they give out the other end is not that much different than you just give to someone who didn't do that testing at all. Um, what, what I do think that maybe where they're getting some good results and could get some results and we'll see some of those companies are doing studies is adherence. Um, so like in the challenge that, that we have, we're not telling people to eat individually. I don't believe we have enough evidence to suggest that, Hey, Michael, you should eat these foods and I should not eat the asparagus and I should eat the broccoli. I don't think we have that evidence. However, I can tell you from experience talking to individuals, if I sat you down, Michael, and you knew nothing at all about nutrition, I said, Hey, Michael, I'm going to do a test and I can tell you based on your physiology, exactly what you should eat for your health. And you go, your eyes are going to light up and I'm going to print something out. And the thing that I print out, I already know it's going to be plant rich, high fiber, high in, high in unsaturated fats, low in saturated fats, low in ultra processed foods. But I'm just going to tailor it a little bit. So you think it's a specific plan to you. Now, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think there's going to be a very high buy-in from the individual who goes, wow, this is personalized for me. I think the personalized aspect is BS, but because you think it's personalized, the adherence might be high and therefore they're getting people eating a healthy diet. So some could argue that the actual effect on that person's health is positive. I, I can definitely see that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out to, to Karen J. If you could state where you're from and, and ask your question. Hi, um, it's Karen and I'm from Maine and I joined in really, really late. So I was just wondering, cause I'd love to watch this from the beginning um, if that's possible to do somehow. Okay, sure. Yeah, so Karen, if um, all of our lectures are, are posted online, um, you have to become a premium membership which uh, if you go to our website, you can go and check out the premium membership section uh, or the membership section and there'll be details there and they're available the next day around 12 o'clock. Thanks, okay. Karen. Perfect, thank you. All right, well, that was interesting. Um, Simon V. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Stephen V. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, yeah. Um... <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Simon. I too came in late. I was on my bicycle. Um, I did Good 25 man. miles on my electric bike. Um, 69 years old. I just downloaded the uh, the PDF. I'm kind of excited about it. Um, I guess because I didn't hear too much of what you were saying, I want to just ask you one th one thing. I've seen you on YouTube before. You're very impressive. What what's your take on measuring omega three, and if you think it's valid, what's your preferred test for that? Trying to get me in in hot water here. This one's a little divisive, but thank you for that, Stephen. And it sounds like you're crushing it. So well done doing that twenty five mile bike ride. I wish I could have joined you on that. Maybe someday. Uh, Okay, omega-3 testing. Uh, okay, where do I start? I've done a few episodes on this with Philip Calder and Bill Harris. Uh, Bill Harris is one of the owners of Omega Quant, so you might say that's a conflict. Um, I think it's unclear if... it's What's unclear is whether we really need a direct source of DHA and EPA or if getting enough ALA, which is, I'm probably telling you things you already know, but in case someone's new to this, if getting enough ALA, which is a, um, a short chain omega-3 fatty acid from plants like chia seeds and flax, walnuts, hemp seeds is enough to maintain what's, you know, a healthy, omega-3 index, DHA, EPA level in our body. So our body at varying levels will convert ALA to DHA and EPA. And that's that depends on genetics. It can depend on the composition of your diet. So if you have a lot of omega-6s in your diet, 
then your conversion of AOA to DHA and EPA might suffer a little bit because they use the same enzymes to facilitate these um, processes of conversion from short chain to long chain omega threes. Um, and then also, you know, people, we know that people who are overweight tend to have lower um, conversion. People who are pregnant tend to have higher conversion. There's a lot of unanswered questions with regards to what all of this means and the long-term data looking at dementia, cognitive health outcomes, which is probably of most interest here, is, is not very clear. And I think we're about to get a little bit more signal. There's going to be some data published on the Adventist cohort that I'm aware of. I'm not going to share it because it hasn't been peer reviewed. So it's subject to peer review and could change. Um, but my personal view is you can measure your omega status with a, an omega-3 index. And, you know, really you don't want that to be below 4%. Some people will get to that with eating enough ALA, again, depending on their genes, largely in diet composition. Others perhaps not, and in that case, they're going to need a DHA EPA supplement, like an algae oil, presuming that they don't want to eat fish. Uh, and in the ballpark of kind of a gram a day of DHA EPA. Now, that's a little bit controversial. Some people think that you don't need that. It's expensive, wastes money. Um, I take the precautionary approach on this. I personally supplement with DHA EPA. I measure my omega-3 index before supplementing with it. My omega-3 index was between 3 and 4%, and that was just on a plant-based diet with TF flax, uh, those foods being intentional and not eating ultra-processed foods, really. So I didn't have like a crazy amount of omega-6 intake, which is where most of the omega-6s would be found. Um and now I sit between 6 and 8%. And I measure that with Omega Quant, I think it's called. Um, I do have the test somewhere. But yeah, uh, Omega Quant, there's one other company. But I would, I would just use Omega Quant if you want to test and see what your Omega 3 index is. Um, I'm comfortable with mine being between 6 to 8%. There are others out there who are aiming for 8 to 12%. I don't think we have the evidence to suggest that that's any better. So uh, along the same lines, um, and I've asked this question of, of multiple speakers. So one one of uh, one of the speakers, and you're probably familiar with, work, is, uh, is Dr. Furman, and he, he talks about this specifically. He he says that he's seen you know uh, a, a decent amount of whole food plant based patients over the years with dementia like symptoms. So then he ends up putting them on uh, omega three. I've asked multiple other doctors, um, you know, Dr. Clapper and, and Pam Popper, and and they they don't see that. Are, are you is it for someone who's whole food plant based, who's who's on point with their with their diet with regard to getting variety and getting the omega three, uh, um, you know, or foods that have high omega three like walnuts and flax and chia. Um, have you heard of people still having issues with with you know rate of, of dementia? Well, I guess the first thing is to be clear is I'm not um, treating people in their seventies, eighties, and nineties and seeing you know that population. Um, secondly, I'm not sure how reliable the kind of n equals one anecdote is because they're not then if there's a selection bias there. Who are they seeing? They're seeing the people that are presenting to them. You don't know how many people are out in the community that are also eating that way and not getting dementia. So you need studies. It has to be studied. Mm. Um, I know I had Joel Furman on my show and he kind of, um, he, he spoke about that and mentioned that. Um, and I actually think he said in that, that Dr. Clapper, and I, I may have got this wrong, but um, I'm pretty sure it's right. He measured his and his was below, significantly below three, four percent. I think it was 3% or something. And at least at that time, Dr. Clapper had added DHA and EPA. He may have changed since then. Um, I'm not sure. But I think most people, like even the shares eyes and neurologists, are, they, they're taking the precautionary approach here and saying, you know, supplementing with an algae oil, it's, it's, low, it's probably fairly low risk. If someone has um, atrial fibrillation, um, then supplementing the DHA and EPA is something you certainly want to talk to your cardiologist about because there is some evidence that it could increase that risk. 
There's also a slight increased risk of bleeding, which can become an issue if you're kind of having surgery because of the effect that it has on blood. But you know, outside of those two things, it seems relatively low risk. So if you can afford it, I think it's a good addition to a whole food plant-based diet. Personally. So uh, just on the clapper, you, you, you are correct. So last year, like he was, he was talking about how he was considering it that Dr. Furman had kind of convinced him. And this year, I asked him, you know, a follow up question to see how he was doing on it, and he said that you know he didn't really notice anything, and that he he's really uh, skeptical. But you know, was really I guess I guess I would push back a tiny bit and and sort of say, you know, it's no different to you, Michael, or me. Like if if there's two questions here, one is like, does DHA and EPA help prevent cognitive decline, dementia? And the other is, if you have cognitive decline, dementia, or you're, you have some symptoms, does it help with that? Right. Right. These are two different, completely different questions. So for you and I to take DHA and EPA and say, hey, we're not experiencing any benefit today, I'd say, well, you know, what, what about chronic exposure to DHA and EPA and how your, what your symptoms are like when you're 60, 70, 80? These are two 